If you've been touched by the grace of God, say amen. 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 Oh, thank you, Jesus, the grace of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Man, I'll tell you, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Yes, he is, and we serve him, and we love him, and we worship him, and we give, and we pray, and we do all that we do because we love the Lord and because he's uh, important in our life, and we're taught by the Word of God to serve him and love him and worship him and obey him and depend on him and expect from him, and he makes promises, and he has all types of uh, uh, things that he says that are blessings to our life and, 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 uh, and fulfillments and, and promises, and God is wonderful in our life. And, and I want to say that right off the bat, so in case anybody might think by something that I preach today that I don't believe that, or I don't think that that's something the Bible teaches us to do because it does. And, and I, I don't want you to be concerned or confused by anything that I say today out of the book of Job about the fact that, um, <clears throat> that, um, that, that, that there are issues about our service to God, uh, d- d- deeper issues. Uh, I know that you know, we all uh, expect things from God uh, we, because he tells us to. I mean, he, he says, I will do great and mighty things that you don't even know about. I'll do more than your eye has seen or your ear has heard. Uh, faith is projected as being one of the greatest weapons against the enemy and the assaults of Satan. And he heals bodies and he, he changes hearts and he moves minds. And, he, and, and, and almost every message that I preach, for sure, uh, I'm trying to take the Word of God and, and show you in the Word of God somebody that the Lord touched in some way, changed in some way, and blessed in some way so that you can say, well, if he did it for them, he can do it for me. And to give you something for your hope to hang on. Uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, I can't give you hope, but I can hopefully encourage your faith to believe God, and faith produces hope, and hope, hope carries us forth in life. Uh, you can't cope without hope. <laughs> That's not like a bumper sticker, right? You can't cope without hope. Well, you can't. So with all of that said, with all of that said, I hope you'll uh, grab the crux of what we're looking at today, and I know if you have your outline, you're already looking at, will a man serve God for nothing? Uh, the message of the book of Job. Uh, will a man serve God for nothing? Uh, let, me just, let me just read the verses out of this first chapter. And I know many of you have heard the jo- story of Job. You've heard it preached. You've, re- you've heard excerpts from it and so forth. But maybe you've never seen the actual verses that talk about it. And let me just read them to you really quick, all right? Starting in chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. I love the old King James word for shunned. It's the word eschewed. If you've ever read it, it's, and he eschewed evil. What does that mean? It means he spit it up, he chewed it up and spit it out. Job was a righteous man. He, he, he loved God. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Everybody say, quite a man. Good man. Woo! All right. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day. Could have been his birthday, or could have been some appointed day that they had set for the family, or whatever it might have been. And his sons would go on each on their appointed day and and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. So thus Job did regularly. Great family man. Now there was a day 
when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Everybody go, "Uh uh-oh. Oh, no. You know something's fixing to happen now, right? And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? I can't read that verse 9 without thinking of many instances, many instances in my 45 years of ministry that follow the scenario that I, if you're looking at the notes, I wrote in the notes. Many instances like this, many, many brands of this kind of thing. We had a, we had a gentleman one time in a, in a church long ago that came and he and his wife were on the edge of divorce. They were separated. And of course, he did not want the divorce. And he came to church and he asked us to pray for him. And we prayed for him like any compassionate, loving church would do. We prayed for him. And and comforted him, and spoke to him, and included him, and just rallied around him like, like any caring bunch of Christians would do for some, someone who needs help. And after a few weeks, he became so involved and so um, uh, impressed by the Lord that he even made a profession of faith and got baptized. And then after about three or four months, it became obvious that they weren't going to get back together. In spite of all the prayer, all of the changes in his life, everything, it wasn't going to happen. And within about a couple of months or so, we never saw him again. Now, I can't read verse 9, does does Job fear God for nothing, without thinking about folks like that. I mean, folks, folks that, that come and seek and, and, and desire and, and, and when it just doesn't seem that whatever it is is going to happen like they want it to happen, it's like, uh, we'll see you later. The real question that the devil is answering, is asking here is, do folks love God for nothing? Do people serve God for nothing? I mean, do, do, people, do people worship God and give and pray? Do, do you do it for nothing? Or is there a motive here? Is there an alternative? Uh, of course, Satan now introduces the fact that he has a plan. Uh, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Now, Satan is looking and saying, hey, who wouldn't serve you, God? I mean, look at his salary, man. The guy's got everything he wants. You bless him in every way possible. Everything he needs, you take care of, and he's just been one of the most blessed people. Who wouldn't serve you for something like that, God? But he said, I got a suggestion for you. If you'll stretch forth your hand and touch all that he has, in other words, if you'll take some of that stuff that he's enjoying away from him, then you'll watch him and he'll curse you to his face. Now, I believe that the central question to the book of Job, and I've preached it all of my life, and there, there are bunches of messages about suffering that can come from the book of Job, about why the righteous suffer, and about how to handle suffering, and about how Job handles suffering. And, 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 and we can get our thoughts all around suffering as a child of God when we think of the book of Job, but I believe that the central question in the book of Job is found in verse 9, and it's asked by the devil, and the question is... Does a man, will a man serve God for nothing? I mean, why do the righteous serve? That's the question. I mean, why are you here today? Why, why, why do you serve the Lord? 
Why do you love God? Why do you give? Why do you pray? Why do you read your Bible? It's not about suffering at all. It's really a, a question about, about commitment. Will a, will a man serve God? Will a man be committed to God uh, for no reason? Now, I believe if all of us would be honest that we would have to say that we have found in our life that it pays to serve God because God makes all of our lives richer and fuller in many, in many ways, in many ways, in many ways we have come to the Lord. And, and where our testimony would be, uh, uh, I love God and I follow God and I obey to God and I've committed to God because my life is just richer because of God and fuller and bigger and better and broader. Some people who tithe, many people who tithe, uh, have the, the concept of tithing that, uh, well, you know, I, I know God tells me to do it, but, but you know, he, he says in his word back over here in Malachi that if I'll do it, he'll rebuke the devourer and he'll make my life better. Yeah. And I, I know many preachers who basically their major selling point for trying to get people to tithe is that God will do more with 90% than you can do with 100%. And I'm, I, the devil is just asking in verse 9, what if that didn't happen? What if, what if you started to tithe this week and then next week you went broke? You started tithing because you thought that was going to be a wonderful opportunity and that God said it and that he made these wonderful promises about it. But when you got out there and you actually did it, it just didn't turn out like the preacher said it was going to do. So I, I, I'm just saying to you that the devil is asking a valid question. And it's a question that we need to answer in our lives. Why do I do the things I do? Why do I sing? Why do I prepare? Why do I write? Why do I study? Why do I give? Why do I pray? The devil is basically asking, can, can anybody do that? without having an ulterior motive? And so we ask ourselves today, I think, three questions. Let me give them to you real quick, all right? Number one, will I serve God if my life turns tragic? Tragedy in my life. Chapter, verse 12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So Satan says, God, I, I, there's, I don't believe that there is anyone that serves you for nothing, and I think I can prove it to you. And if you will allow me to do some things to Job, I think I can prove it to you that he has some ulterior motives as to why he serves you. So he went out and God said, don't lay a hand on his person. That means anything outside of his personal body, you can do whatever you'd like to do. And Satan went and had a whale of a time. Now there was, look, now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians, I wonder if it's related to Nick in that movie. No, that's not the Sabians. That's the Sabians. Uh, when the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans have formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in your oldest brother's house, and, and the older brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, to say 
bad day doesn't even come in the area code of what's going on in this situation. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and said, I'm going to shoot the next servant that walks through that door. Is that, that's not what he says, right? Not that, you won't even find that in the living Bible. <laughs> he, said, he said, then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and, what, and he fell to the ground and worshiped goodness, and said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the devil has taken away. No, I read that wrong too, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. It says, and the Lord has taken away. Job says, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. And then tells us our appropriate response to that. Blessed. I like the way the old people used to say, blessed. Not blessed, blessed. <laughs> blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. So God wins round one. Will a man serve God for nothing? Will a man serve God when life turns tragic? The devil says, no, he won't. But Job says, all right, I'm holding on, God. <laughs> Whew, you, you give and you take away, and I know you do. And I'm going to bless your name, and I'm going to worship you. And, I'm gonna, and, 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 and God wins that round, but you know that the devil's not finished, right? I mean, he's come at you before. You know how he does. Oh, he's not going to leave him alone. So in chapter 2, uh, he picks right on him, and there was a day. Oh, by the way, let me just mention this to you because it's easy to forget this. Do you, you do remember that the only reason all of this stuff is happening to Job is because God bragged on him. You do know that, right? You remember that? Kind of makes you want to say, God, you know, if you and the devil are talking again, how about leave my name out of it? Yeah. And, 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 and so here God, but, he, but, God, but God doesn't leave his name out. Look at, look at him right here again. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, where do you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, well, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Oh, God. You th that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. And still, God says, and, you know, you've already tried him that first time. Boy, you had a whale of a time. What happened to him? Did he curse me to my face? No. The devil pouts, no. And still, God said, and still holds fast his integrity. This is a very key little point right here. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Do you see what God is saying here? Because I want to call this to your attention. I don't know how many of you have ever had to deal with, with a lot of the theologies that fly around in this crazy world we live in. I know many of you have been in church all your life, and many of you have been in churches that had different kind of thoughts about healing and health and wealth and prosperity and all of that than we do. I mean, I believe God uh, will do what he says he'll do, and I believe God will bless you, and I believe that God will do everything that he says he'll do. But there are churches that preach that if God is pleased with you, you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And if God is, and if you're sick and broken down, it means you somehow have sin in your life. I mean, the theology of the Old Testament, seriously, the Old Testament theology, and you'll see it in just a minute because he's going to have his wife and friends. You'll see what they think. The theology of the Old Testament was, if you're a blessed man, you are blessed by God. If you, are a, if you are cursed by God with stuff like this, it's because you have sin in your life. I'm sure glad that theology is not around anymore, aren't you? Oh, no, the world's full of it. But I just want to call your attention here. And, and, and I've heard the health and wealth boys preach many times. And, I, and I've heard them say, when it comes to the book of Job, this is a problem. Job is a problem to the health and wealth uh, theology bunch. 
But then they, they turn to chapter 3, verse 25, and they say, and Job says, I hate to say it, but my greatest fear has come upon me. And then they'll jump on that and they'll say, well, there you go. If Job wasn't afraid it was going to happen to him, it would have never happened to him. That's why God did it, because he was afraid. Except verse 3 says, God said, I did it for no reason. You incited me to, to do all of, to allow you to do all of this for without cause, for no reason. And I'm just saying to you that we have to come to an understanding that sometimes we suffer for no reason, or at least not one we can understand. And so Satan comes in and he has a well time, and he goes to God and he says, All right, God. Um, all right, Lord, uh, skin for skin, skin for skin, God. Uh, yes, all that a man has, uh, he will give for his life. So God says, the devil's saying, okay, yeah, uh, I, he didn't curse you to your face, but it was because he didn't have any skin in the game. It was because it was just his kids and his wealth and his possessions and his job and his business and his other life. And if you'll just touch, if you'll touch him, I'll guarantee you nobody is going to stand firm when their life is on the line. But stretch forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. Okay, you can do anything to him, but you can't kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and had a whale of a time and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd. Everybody say, a broken piece of pottery. Job took a broken piece of pottery to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. I, I, just, want to, I just want you to, to get the, the picture of this for just a second. Last week, Job was president of the city council. This week, he's sitting on the city dump. Job was president of the PTA, man of the year. The greatest guy in all the city, everybody looked up to him. His family was wonderful. He was rich, well increased with goods, and had need of nothing. He loved God, and he was a wonderful man, and everybody praised him and looked at him. And, 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 and in less, than, less than, a, than a day or two, here he is. His, his family's gone. His children are gone. His money's gone. His business is gone. And his body has been touched with a... With a, with, a, with, with a type of leprous sore that is so loathsome that he has to be banished to the city garbage dump to sit there and scrape those sores with a broken piece of pottery. Now, what you going to do, Job? You still going to praise God? Hey, not so easy to praise God now, is it, buddy? Easy to praise God when... Got a chicken in the pot and money on the, in, the, in the bank and you got all your, 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 your business and you got your kids, you got your wife. I mean, it's real easy to praise the Lord, I wrote in your notes, when the good have the goods. <laughs> but when the goods get taken away from you, it's not so easy to praise him. Not so easy to praise the Lord. Will, will, a, will, a, will, will a person serve God when life turns tragic? Will you serve God if your life turns tragic? Let me talk about tragedy and suffering for just a second. There is a type of suffering that we all understand. It's called cause and effect. We all understand suffering that has a cause, and it causes an effect. In other words... Uh, a, a fellow sits here with a fifth of vodka, drinks the fifth of vodka, gets in his automobile, goes out on the road, runs in the ditch, and hits a tree. Okay, we understand that. We probably would be saying, hey, he, he gets what he deserves. He's got what coming to him. If you drink a fifth of vodka and then get in an automobile, you ought to run off the road. But then there's, then there's suffering that we don't understand. 
because it seemingly has no root to a cause. It is senseless. A three-year-old runs out in the street to chasing a ball, hit by an automobile, and the little thing dies. Tragedy. Some parents take their child to bed, put him in bed, two years old, and comes back in the morning, and, 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 and the child never wakes up. The tragedy. There's no cause linked to that. There's no, there's no, there's no sense in that. Suffering to which we can't connect any cause. That's what this is. God in verse 3 said, You incited me to allow you to do this for no reason at all. Job has suffered because of no reason. Now, now if there was a reason for it, we could possibly understand it. We could, we could grasp it and we could say, you know, um, uh, if he was a sinner then we could look at him and say, well, we know why he's getting hammered by God because he's a sinner and, and I'm glad to know that there's justice in the universe and I'm glad to know that there's a come up and for sin. Or if he was just a regular, uh, nominal Christian kind of a person. You know, I mean, one of those, they kind of came to church and they tried to live right, and they, but they weren't real faithful and they didn't, you know, uh, they just kind of uh, hung in there a little bit. You know, we might even could understand somebody like that getting blasted from God every now and then. I mean, you got to wake them up. Come on, man, you know. <laughs> you ought to get serious about God. But here is a man who is the most righteous person on the face of God's earth, and God said he was. That wasn't his mother that said that. It was God that said that. And God said, this person is the most holy, righteous, upright person on the face of the earth, and yet here he is losing everything. Tragic loss. Because there's no good reason for it. I, I love to hear, I, I, don't, I know you guys aren't aware of it because I'm, I'm older now and I have a lot going on in my life. But my hobby used to be listening to preachers. I love to listen to preaching. It's my hobby. I used to love to listen to a pastor that turned evangelist. His name was Ron Dunn. Great guy. He's gone. He, Twenty years ago, he went to be with the Lord. So he's long, long gone. Great preacher. He had a son. He had four children, if I'm not mistaken. I heard him preach a bunch of times. He shared this. I'm not trying to share anything behind the scenes. He shared this in messages. His son, when he was a teenager, one of his sons, when he was a teenager, committed suicide. And, of course, being a pastor, being a preacher, and your child committing suicide, um, let me just say, back in that day, was, was, a, was a very tough mark. Uh, people, people looked at you funny, squinty-eyed, you know. I mean, what's going on here? You're a preacher, you've got a son committed suicide. What's up with that? Well, he said that in spite of that kind of attitude, that there were lots of people that sent him letters of sympathy and compassion. And he said he, he, he particularly remembered one from a couple in Memphis. And, he, and, and in the first paragraph, it was nothing really descript about it. It was basically just consoling him about what had happened and promising prayer. But in the second paragraph, the second paragraph uh, started and, and, and said, and, and I wrote it down. I wrote down what he said back then. It's so amazing. He said, Brother Dunn, we know that you are a man of God. Now listen to this. And that you have devoted your life to the preaching and the teaching of Jesus and serving him in every way possible. And here's what God... We do not understand how something like this could happen to you. You see, they, they might be able to understand how something like this would happen to them. 
but they don't understand. You're a man of God. I mean, how does this kind of thing happen to you? If being, if, if being a Christian and being a preacher and dedicating your life to the Lord and serving the Lord in every way possible doesn't mean anything, then why do it? I think God ought to keep this in mind when he's passing out catastrophes and calamities. Hey, God, remember, I'm on your side. I think what the real fear is, hey, if that kind of stuff can happen to somebody like you, what would the devil do to somebody like me? I mean, you know, really. And, he, and Ron mentioned, and this is such, a, this is such a, a noticeable thing, if you've ever done this in your life, I don't know what it is about suffering and shame, but we just about can't disassociate ourselves from suffering and shame. If we're suffering, we're shamed. Like our suffering has something to do with something we should be ashamed of. It's just kind of a natural human collection that you just put together. I, 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 can remember, I can remember hearing Ron preach about his you know, uh, life and then his son committed suicide and he would quickly add, uh, you know, he was manic depressive. Why would he say that? Why does he feel like he needed to say quickly, but he was manic depressive? Because he didn't want people to think he was a bad father. Because he didn't want people to think that there was some shame in his family. Will a man serve God for nothing? Will a man serve God? Will I serve God when my life turns tragic? Let me give you a second question. Are y'all okay? All right. Will I serve God if I must stand alone? I mean, we're all together and we love God. But if I had to stand by myself... Would I serve God? Would I still serve God and love God? When my friends forsake me? When, 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 when the, the people around me don't understand me? Because here's Job sitting on a, on a city dump, scratching his, his leprous sores with, pot, with a piece of pottery. Uh, but bless God, bless God, here comes his wife. Here comes some consolation. Here comes some compassion. Here comes some sympathy coming down the aisle to him. I mean, he's out there and he's suffering, but bless the Lord, his wife is on the way and I know she's going to bless him. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Not very compassionate. Not very comforting or consoling either, right? <laughs> yeah. But that's all right. That's all right. Hey, hey, his wife might feel like that. Notice what he said to her. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we, look at this. Look at this. Look, look at, the, look at the, the, the attitude. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? We're all happy when God does good stuff for us. Are we still going to praise him when he doesn't do good stuff for us? That's what he's asking. Oh, you can be happy when everything's going good, but what, ha what happens when it goes bad? Is God still good? Is God still on the throne? Is God still great God when things go bad? This is what the devil is, is saying. And, and in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. But his friends are on the way. Good news. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity they had come upon him, that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. So they, they're from different places. They're not all in the same city. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, by the way, that's the smallest man in the Bible. He was only Shuhite. Uh, <laughs> forgive me, got to have a little levity when you're getting this hard. Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Nathamite. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. So here comes his three best friends. And they've come together, come a long journey to see him so that they can, they've heard of all the stuff that's happened and we're coming to comfort our best friend. And when they raise their eyes from afar, 
and did not recognize him. I mean, he was so loathsome, so leprously sore covered, pile of goo, they couldn't even recognize him. His three best friends couldn't even recognize him. They lifted their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. His three best friends come to console him and comfort him and and, 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 and try to help him in the midst of all of this struggle that he's going through. And, and, and my goodness, they don't even recognize him as, as, as their friend. But when they get there, they, they, they walk up to Job and they sit down and they stare at Job for seven days like, like vultures on a, on, a, on a limb looking at Job. Well... There's, there's a reason for this. In, the, in this day, until the host spoke, you, you couldn't speak. I think that's kind of interesting because they sit there for seven days before Job says anything to them. I mean, you know, really. I mean, my three friends are coming to bless me and console me and comfort me with all of this mess going on in my life, and I sit there and I don't say a word to them so they can't say a word to me. For seven days? That tells you something about what he thinks they're going to say, right? And sure enough, uh, they didn't disappoint him because when they started speaking, they started accusing him. They said, Job, come on, man. You know you did wrong. Fess up. Uh, come clean. Do, what did you do? Uh, go down there and make an offering. Uh, turn over a new leaf. Uh, Get a new philosophy in life. Job, just, you know, do something to, uh, to get yourself right with God. Because obviously you have done horribly wrong. Obviously you are a wicked, no good, ungodly, reprobate sinner. Anybody could see that. God would never do any of these things to anybody but somebody that deserved that, Job. So come on, man, get right with God. He's about to kill you. Job knew he hadn't done a thing. But everybody else thought he did. So will I serve God when my friends don't understand? When my friends forsake me? When my family leaves me? Will I serve God? in spite of the fact that I'm the only one that stands there alone. I tell you, in this day we're living in, I, I, I admire people, I respect people who in some of the business situations that you guys are in, that you can speak the name of the Lord. It's tremendous. You're not fearful. You've witnessed any way you possibly can. You sneak it in under the cover. You come in the back door. Some of you knock down the front door. And you stand for Jesus. And I know some of you face maybe being fired or, or, or reprimanded in some way or, or in some way it's not going to be good for you because this whole crazy world grows more and more uh, hostile toward the things of God. I mean, any, any, any cult and voodoo and mystic and, and whatever else you want to call them can pop up on every corner and receive tax credits, and anything that's about Christ gets the old heave-ho, man. I mean, let's make it as hard as we can on them. And I know it's difficult, and I respect and admire that. And you kids that have to stand up in school to some of the situations that you have to stand up, and you're pure, and you can be pure and strong, I'm telling you, that is a tremendous thing. But will a man serve God if he has to stand alone? Will I serve God? Hey, why do I serve God? Will I serve God if my life turns tragic? Will I, will I serve God if, if I'm the only one that's doing it? And then here's the third question that may be the most difficult of all. Will I serve God when God is silent? Yeah. 
Yeah, might be hardest of all because, you know, we, most of us feel like, hey, you know, if, uh, if God would just tell me why this was happening to me, you know, I, I, I could probably understand this and I could probably get with the program, but, but I, I don't even know why God's, I don't even know why this is happening to me. God won't say anything to me. Well, God didn't say anything to Job either. Do you know that God never did tell Job why he, why he suffered like that? Do you know we know, we know, because we saw what happened in the beginning. We know that it was God who flung down the gauntlet to Satan and challenged Satan to a duel in the body of Job. <laughs> but Job didn't know that. Not any in the whole book, never did God one time in the whole book say anything to Job about why this suffering came upon him. And Job just lamb blasted God. Listen, I'm telling you, you've heard the phrase, the patience of Job. Well, if you will read the book of Job, you will probably get another little version of that. Because Job just blasts God. In chapter 7, just read chapter 7 alone. Just take that one. Job is sitting there and he is just, man, he is just raking God over the coal. And, and he finally looks at God and he said, why are you just standing there looking at me? I can't even spit on the ground without you seeing it. Ooh, ooh. So even though God didn't speak to him about his suffering, God finally did speak. Would you like to see a few things God said? Just kind of, you know. Now, when God started speaking, it, here's, what, here's what he said. I'm just picking out a few verses. You read all of chapter 38. Read all of the end, the whole end. You can, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? All right, big boy. You've got a lot of accusations going on there, and you've accused me of a lot of things, and you've accused me of mismanagement and not knowing what I'm doing. I'm just going to ask you, who are you to be talking to me like that? Now prepare yourself like a man and I'll question you and you answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You know, I don't remember seeing you out there, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth. Where were you? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? I mean, turn to the Discovery Channel, Job, and let's get some answers about this, all right? Surely you know. Or who stretched a line upon it? To, to what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? I know, hey, look, I know that you're a big shot, and I know you've been demanding answers, so you obviously know all about this, and you are a part of this, so Job, tell me the answers to these things. And when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, have you entered the springs of the earth? Have you walked in search of the depths? Have you... Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breath of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. <laughs> I'm not sure I would be asking God for an answer about something myself. <laughs> It'd be just, hey, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm with you, God. Move on. <laughs> Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send lightnings that may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the mind or who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can pour out bottles of heaven when the dust hardens and clumps and the clogs cling together? Come on, Job. Those are easy questions. You were there, obviously. You're demanding answers. Tell me if you can. You know what God was saying to Job? God was showing Job who Job was, and God was showing Job who God is. And, there, and even though he never told him why he was suffering, he did tell him three things. Number one, I'll give them to you quickly. God reminds Job, whatever I do, I have the right to do. That's what all those verses before just said, right? I created this. I laid the foundation. I hung the stars on nothing. I opened the deeps. I call the water from the clouds. I control the weather. I, I, I have the right to do anything I want to do, Job. Now, let me ask you. Will you serve God 
for the very reason that God has the right to do anything he wants to do and he doesn't owe us an explanation for it. Number two, well, then Job answered and said, I know that you can do everything. So Job said, okay, I know you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. In other words, God, I know you can do anything and you can do anything you want to to me. So, hey, <laughs> there's no argument there, God, all right? Second question or second statement, God reminds him, whatever I do, I have a reason for doing it. You might not understand the reason, but I have a purpose and a plan for everything. How many of you in here believe that God has a purpose and a plan for everything in life? I believe God has a purpose and plan for everything. And that nothing happens that God is not aware of. And nothing happens that God does not allow on this earth. The devil could not touch Job had God not removed the, the barrier from around Job. God knows everything. He has a purpose and a plan in our life. And he says to Job, if I, if I allow something to happen, there's a reason for what happens in life. So not only do I have the right to do it, I have a reason for doing it. And then number three, whatever I do has a reward that follows it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we finally get a tad of relief here. God says... That, mm, let me give it to you. Let me give it to you. All right. You know, I've been asking the question, you know, uh, what, if God, what if God didn't give you all these blessings? What if God didn't um, assure you of great things in your life? Uh, many of us are saved because we don't want to go to hell when we die. I mean, the motive is, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven when I die. Amen. You know, I mean... Will we serve God if there is no reward? Verse, chapter 42, verse 10, look at this. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Yeah, those vultures that were hanging out there watching him <laughs> and accusing him and accusing him. You did it, Job. You know, you know I mean? Job, I'm innocent. I did nothing. Believe me. And they preached to him for weeks. Come on, Joe, man. Come on, fess up. You did it. I didn't do it. When he turned around and started praying for them, Lord, bless them. Lord, I don't know what's going on with the guys, but touch their lives. Lord, bless their lives. They're good men. They're not trying to be wrong. Lord, help them. When he started doing that, broke God's heart. I know you can't picture God's heart being broken, but I'm going to tell you. God had, to, God, had to, God had to open the door and let the devil go in and do all that to Job. And when Job ended up praying for his friends, God said, that is far enough. Boom! <laughs> you know, you can't do that anymore. Good night, man. You're killing me. <laughs> and God, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice. You, you remember that in, in, in verse 12? He had like, what was it? He had uh, uh, 3,000. He had 7,000 camels. We'll, we'll get to it in just a second. It, it gave us the list of how much stuff he had. 500 of this, 500 of this, 1,000 of that, 3,000 of that. All right, look. Then all of his brothers and his sisters and all those that had been his acquaintance before came to him and ate food with him in his house and they consoled him and they comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning for he had, remember at the beginning he had 7,000 sheep, he had 3,000 camels, he had 500 yoke of oxen and 5,000 5, female camels. Look what he's got now. And he had seven sons and three daughters. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning for he had now 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 2,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had 14 sons and six daughters. Wait a minute. I'm, Tanya, did you put that? Is that right? Did you put that verse up there? Does anybody have a Bible in their hand? Does it say that? I'm thinking there's been a misprint here or something. I must have one of those liberal Bibles or something. But what is it? He also had seven. He's supposed to have 20 sons and, I mean, 20, uh, 14 sons and six daughters. He had 10 kids before. He got double everything. Else. He, got, he got double the sheep, double the camels, double the oxen, double the donkeys. 
and they ought to get double the sons and double the daughters. There ought to be, you know, 20 kids and tw- uh, 10 here and, and you know. No, no. Oh, oh, wait, wait, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it figured out. All right, here it is. Here it is. He has seven sons and three daughters here on earth, and he's got seven sons and three daughters in heaven. They're not lost when you know where they are, right? And when Job gets to heaven one day, he'll have 20, he'll have 14 sons and six daughters. God is so good to us. So, will a man serve God for nothing? It's really a trick question. It's impossible to serve God for nothing because God always has a reward. 